Well, good morning. I have been told that this week is the week that people take the most vacations during the summer. So this is the week that we are going to try some things differently. <laughs> Let's start with having the kids come forward. Remember, we've done this before. Um, where's Gene Fletcher? There's, okay, wave again. She is responsible for what is in this bag. <laughs> I have no idea what is in this bag. But I'm going to open this bag, and we're going to talk about it. Is that crazy or what? Liam, you've got the best shirt ever. Go Ducks. Go Beavers. Go IT Hustling Owls. Okay. You guys ready for me to open this? There's been lots of jokes about, like, is it going to be a dead squirrel? Dead squirrel. Dead. <laughs> I heard that. Now, I'm supposed to give a devotional to you guys based on this. Can anyone tell me what this is? A jester's hat. A hat. Is a jester wise or is he foolish? foolish? Foolish. Do you want to listen to the advice that a jester gives? If a jester says, this is what's important in life, do you listen? If a jester says, this is how you should live, do you listen? If a jester says, this is what you should do and shouldn't do, do you listen? No. The Bible, in fact, the passage we're going to look at this morning, tells us that what the world says is wise is just like listening to a jester. It's just like listening to a fool. And then if we follow what the world says is wise instead of what God says is wise, we end up making horrible decisions and going down a path that is very hard to recover from. That's what today's message is all about. So if your parents start to fall asleep in the service or if they start to lose track, just say, that's what the message is about. That's what we're going to be talking about. That's what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So almost all of you are dismissed to go back to your seats except for Aiden Harrison. And Gene Fletcher is in serious trouble. <laughs> okay, Annalise, you can come up here too. And Are you guys going to come up? Okay. Aiden, do you know why you're up here? Because I changed the battery. Yes. Something really cool has happened that we want to celebrate as a church. Aiden was given a Bible for Christmas. For his baptism. Okay, that's what it was. And when Aiden got his Bible, he said, I'm going to start reading. And Aiden has just finished reading through the entire Bible. So to celebrate, my understanding is, Aiden, you're going to pay for the entire church to go out to lunch? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. I don't you don't have enough money? Okay, we'll talk to your mom. No, um, <laughs> we don't either. <laughs> this says Certificate of Achievement. This certifies that Aiden Harrison read through the entire Bible. Award presented at Fellowship Bible Church of Longview, Texas. It is signed by Rebecca Simcox and some guy named Todd Malone. Thank you. <laughs> well done. And Rebecca has something for you as well. We have this for you. It's uh, from the kids' ministry, and it's to help you pay for your lunch today, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Woo Let's give Aiden. Let's 
get that thing as far away from me as possible. Um, yeah, this is supposed to be a low attendance Sunday, so like I said, we're trying some new things. One of the new things that we're trying this morning is I'm actually going to try to run the PowerPoint from up here. Theoretically, that's going to make it easier on some people. Um, Gary Lewis promised that he would be sitting up front when I have a complete technology meltdown. He can run up here and save the day. So, Gary, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's way too far in the back. I think Gary has adopted the position of, I'm going to wait and see what happens and laugh along with everyone else. <laughs> There's a question that I like to ask, haven't asked it in a while. The question is, what did you anticipate when you came in here this morning? What did you anticipate happening when you came to church? And it is my desire that what you, whether you anticipated this or not, that what actually happens is that you will encounter the Lord in a way that transforms your life. That is exactly what has happened to us here at FBC, and it is what we want to have happen for everyone. Um, I want to make an observation about worship about our singing. I need to do a better job of worship is really everything we do here on Sunday morning, and it extends way beyond what happens on Sunday morning. But if you think about it, even the announcements are a part of worship. Um, I had a lot of people make comments to me this past week that the singing was just powerful last Sunday. That people just had the hair on the back of their necks just come up. And my response was, you know why that happened, right? It's because we were a church that was worshiping all week long in prayer. You see, if we walk in here, having encountered the Lord and been walking with the Lord and worshiping the Lord throughout the week, then we're not asking the people up here to lead us into worship, and we shouldn't be asking them to lead us into worship. We are coming together to do what we have been doing and what all of creation has been doing for all of eternity and is doing right now. But I think it really made a difference that we were a church engaged in the 40 days of prayer. Um, and I think it made a difference this morning. Just uh, give you a heads up on something that's coming. On August 25th, that's the first Sunday after the 40 days of prayer ends, we are going to take time out of the service and we are going to allow you to share what has God been doing in your life during this 40 days of prayer? How have you seen him at work? And I'm very excited to hear the stories of what God is up to. Well, our passage this morning, as I mentioned to the kids, is in 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 25. I'm giving you a heads up so you can start turning in your Bible there. Um, and as you're turned there, I want to ask a question. Have you ever come across confusing road signs. Stop. No parking, no stopping, no standing anytime. What do you do when you come to this? If I stop, I'm going to get a ticket. If I don't stop, I'm going to get a ticket. And if it's me, I'm just going, I'm accelerating right through it. This is another one. It's a little harder to see, but it's very similar. It says trucks all trucks exit here. No trucks or buses. <laughs> Again, if you're driving a truck, what do you do? I guess you just, yeah, or you just come to a stop. I have no idea. I like these pictures because it reminds me of what happens a lot on a Sunday morning. We tend to come to church looking for road signs. We tend to come to church looking for road signs that are very much like the two road signs we saw up here. Tell me what to stop doing so my life doesn't go off the rails. Tell me what direction to go so that I can find true life. And here's the problem. 
very often because of the expectations that we have when we walk into church or because of the expectations that the pastor has when he puts together a service and a sermon, what we get is just as confusing as these signs. What we get leaves us not really understanding the right way we should be going, and it leaves us completely lost. We're in the seventh week of our Define the Relationship series. This is a series about who is the church, what is the church, and what should the church be doing. And in the very first week, we saw that the church is built by Jesus. It's not built by us. It's not up to our efforts. This is what Jesus is doing. And then the next five, different pictures, different metaphors that the New Testament uses to picture the church. Things like the church is a family. There's to be an intimacy with one another that is characterized in our family relationships. The church is a body. It's made up of diverse parts that all fit together and all have a purpose. The church is a people. We are a representation. We are an embassy of God's kingdom in a world that desperately needs it. The church is a temple. It is a place where God dwells and through which God works. And it is a place where we encounter the Lord in a powerful way. And then finally, last week, we saw that the church is a flock. The church is under the protection and authority of leadership that God has put into place. We can summarize this. Hey, oh, where I drew the line, so to speak, is really the first part of the series. And now this isn't fit. I'm just going to do this and we'll see what happens. Um, where we are shifting in the second part of the series is what is to the right of that line for the purpose of worshiping God and proclaiming the gospel in this morning. We're going to look at one of the ways that we proclaim the gospel, and that is through the preaching of God's word. We proclaim the gospel not just to the world, but we proclaim the gospel to one another. And when we are done, there are certain things that you should be able to do at the end of this sermon. You should be able to know how to grade my sermons. Please don't. You should know what to expect when you walk through these doors and you should know what is the type of content that makes a Christ-centered sermon a truly Christ-centered sermon. We're going to read through the passage. I'm actually going to start one verse back in verse 17 and I want to read through it so we can have some context for what Paul is saying. Paul starts... In verse 17, by saying this, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. What did he preach? The gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Let's stop right there and make some observations. Paul is talking about two different ways to approach how he preaches. There is either a gospel-focused way of approaching, or what he calls eloquent words of wisdom. And in verses 18 through 25, those are the two ways that he is going to unpack for us. So pay attention to that, and also pay attention to two types of people 
that he describes in this passage. So starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, preaching Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. There are two competing definitions of wisdom in this passage. There is the wisdom of the world, and then there is the wisdom of God. And it's tempting to churches to fall into the pattern of proclaiming the wisdom of the world. And we must be on our guard against this. And as we walk through this passage, what I want us to pay attention to is what is the wisdom of the world? Then we're going to look at what is the wisdom of God. We're going to look at the two different groups of people. And finally, we're going to look at the implications for FBC. But verse 20 starts us off with the content of what the world's wisdom is. And we see it in these three people that are described in this passage. There is the one who is wise, there is the scribe, and there is the debater of this age. Who are those people? The wise would be the person in the Greek culture who was an absolute rock star. These are the people who would come into a town, and they would travel from town to town, and they would set up lectures, and they would talk about the big pictures, of big issues of life. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? How do we know when something is right or something is wrong? What is the nature of what is good? What is the nature of what is beautiful? These are the big pictures of life. And these are the rock stars of Greek culture of that age. The scribes are from the Jewish culture. They are the people who would look at the Old Testament and say, this is what the laws are. And I will make a judgment for how you are to live that out in day-to-day -day life. And they are the ones who would set up the rules. They were the ones who would make the determinations for this is what's okay, this is what's not okay in day-to-day -day life. You could think of that first group kind of like the, well, we don't have a really good parallel, but, but maybe the Oprah Winfrey's or Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz. You could think, think of the second group as a Judge Judy. We're, it's a threat. We're working here. We're working with what we've got. Who's the third group? The debater of this age. These are people who are powerful speakers. They are brilliant minds. They are people, it's almost a catch-all. People that because of their communication ability or because of their intellect, the culture stops and listens. In my generation, there was a guy who epitomized this. His name was Carl Sagan. Some of you remember him from the TV show Cosmos. I guess the follow-up to him would be the guy who took over and did the second generation of Cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson. These are people, when they come on TV, when they speak, their opinion matters, even if they're talking about things that they're not experts in. The bottom line is the wise, the scribe, the debater of this age, or people that the culture listened to. And here is the essence of what they had to say. This is what makes their wisdom worldly wisdom. It is basically, I am independent. I can do it myself. I can have control. What makes it worldly wisdom 
is that everything that they say for us to accomplish and everything that we can accomplish according to them is done on our own without God. And that is exactly our natural tendency. Right? What do you start dealing with when you start dealing with a two-year-old? Trouble. <laughs> Preach it. Um, I can do it myself. They may not have the word, I am independent, but that is exactly what they are going for. And that is the message of worldly wisdom. The assumption is that all you need in life is to apply the principles of, of the wise. It is to follow the rules of the scribe. It is to think like the, the debaters of this age. And if you do that, you can get the results that you want. And Paul says there are consequences for following the wisdom of the world. Paul says in verse 19 that God will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise. In other words, and it also he will thwart their discernment. In other words, he will destroy it. He will bring it to ruin. He will thwart it. He will make it invalid. He will make it useless. It will not accomplish what the wise thinks it will accomplish, it will only lead them to ruin. Paul continues describing the consequences in verse 20. He says that he has made foolish the wisdom of the world. I want you to stop and think about the most successful non-Christian that you know of. However you think of success, the greatest athlete, the wealthiest person, the most famous person. Just stop and think about that person for a second. And then I want to ask you a question. Is that person wise or foolish? Let me bring this question home to you. Would you trade places with that person? Would you give up your relationship with God to have what they have. These people are wise by the world's standards. But will they be wise in the long run? Even they, in the long run, are going to say they were foolish. Because for all that they had, their soul was bankrupt. Third consequence is that the world did not know God through their wisdom. If it leads you to ruin, it's ultimately foolish, and you cannot know God through it. And that just makes sense, right? It just makes sense. If you believe that you can go through life just applying the rules and just applying the principles and you don't really need God, then your life is never going to lead you to the knowledge of God. The best that you can hope for maybe is to know about God. See, and here's where we need to pause for a second because churches, pastors, are very, very tempted all the time. I am tempted and have given in to this temptation. That what we want to do in Sunday morning is to find really good life advice for you and slap some Bible verses on it and say that this is God's word. But what I've really done is I've sent the message that God is not necessary for daily life. All you have to do is apply the principles, live by the rules, think a certain way. And then you can accomplish what you want. And we have to be guarded, guarded against this because Paul says, if that's what you do, if that's the way you go, you're going to find that the advice leads to ruin. You're going to find that people do not, in fact, get what they thought they were going to get. In the long run, they will consider themselves to be foolish, and you will find that they will truly never know God. This is interesting that research shows that um, 
One of the most common reasons that kid le kids leave the church after graduation is because they were raised on this type of preaching. Right? They were raised on the preaching of. All you have to do is apply the principles, live by the rules, and you will get what you want. God doesn't factor in. So guess what? When they go to college, they get more principles and they get more rules. God still doesn't factor in. Why do they need, to, why do they need the church? And this just doesn't happen on secular campuses. There's a disengagement that happens for youth, even in Christian campuses, because all they have been taught is that the Christian life is really about just applying principles and following rules. They don't really understand what it means to have a life with God. The wisdom of man comes down to this. It is in awe of what man can achieve. But Paul preached a very different message. He preached the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God, and I have no idea why we have this funny little line here, but we do. Um, the wisdom of God comes down to being in awe of the power of God. It is the gospel. That's what he means when he talks about the word of the cross, Christ crucified. That's a shortcut way of saying this is the gospel of Christ. Verses like this always seem very strange to me. When I come to verse 23, isn't it odd that preaches in the present tense? Paul, you're talking to Christians. Why do you preach the gospel? They've already accepted Jesus. They're going to heaven. What's the point? And I found that very, very confusing. And then I'd come across a verse like Romans uh, 1, verse 15, where Paul says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you. Who's he talking to? The Christians in Rome. Why does Paul throughout the New Testament keep talking about preaching the gospel to Christians? And I realized it's maybe because I have a very small view of what the gospel is. Maybe my problem is that I think the gospel is just about going to heaven when I die. When the gospel is really about life with God now and for eternity. Let's unpack what Paul's message of the gospel is. Paul's message of the gospel starts with a problem. What's the problem we have to overcome? Sort of. The problem is that we're separated from God. How did we get that problem? Now, let me refine that even more. It's not just that we sin. It's that we are sinners. There's a difference. If we think that the reason that we are separated from God is what we do and don't do, then what's the solution? To stop doing those things that we shouldn't do and to start doing those things that we should. We don't, we sin because we are sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. In other words, the problem is in us. It is not something we can fix on our own. How do we experience that in life? We just sang about it. We are slaves to fear. We experience the sin by the brokenness that is in our lives, the fear that dominates our lives, the guilt that we constantly feel, and we respond to that by constantly trying to find ways that we can gain control of life so that we do not have to be afraid. This is where the gospel starts. We don't like it to start here because we want to think that we are capable on our own. But this is where the gospel starts. What's the solution? 
No one's saying anything out loud. Union with Jesus. That sounds weird. That's how Paul talks about it in Romans. We are united with Christ. We are united in his life. We are united with him in his death. We are united with him in his resurrection. What that means is that when the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus. When the Father looks at all of the bad things that we want to hide and we don't want to tell anyone about that we are ashamed of, that we wish we could hide from ourselves, what he sees is the death of Christ and he says, you are forgiven. When we feel like we have failed again and again and again, what the Father looks at is the perfect life that Jesus lived that we should have lived. And he says, I give you credit for that. When Jesus was raised from the dead, the Bible says the same power that raised him from the dead, the Holy Spirit is at work in you and in me to make us new, to replace a life that is enslaved to fear. How do we enter into the solution? This is what Jesus said. Repent, believe, and follow me. That doesn't mean works. Really, those three things all naturally go together. It's saying about the solution that what Jesus said is true. He is who he said he is, the Son of God. He did what he said he would do, died on the cross, was raised three days later, that my sins would be forgiven, and that I could have new life in him. If I really believe that, then I'm going to look at this part of my life and say, I don't want that anymore. That's repentance. And we're going to say, I don't want to live this way anymore. I want to replace it with something. That's following Jesus. What do we experience day to day? Life with God. And life with God is lived out doing what? Repent, believe, follow Jesus. I sin. I go to God and say, this is not who I want to be. Forgive me. I believe that I am forgiven. I believe and trust that God is at work in my life and I follow Jesus. How does that work out in day-to-day -day life? We'll take Paul for an example. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ. What's he talking about in that verse? Is he talking about that I can be a great athlete? Look at the verse right before it. Paul says, I can live in poverty, I can live in wealth, and I can be content. The all things is talking about I can live in poverty or wealth. Paul says it's because I don't have to live in fear if I'm in poverty of what I don't have. And I don't have to live in fear if I'm in wealth of what I might lose. Because I know who takes care of me. And it is Christ. We must be reminded every Sunday that God knows our deepest, darkest secrets. That God knows that we live in a broken world. And he loves us and he is with us. One day we are going to experience the perfect life with God. And that's going to happen in heaven. But between now and then, we experience a daily life with God that changes us to be more like Christ. Consequences of preaching the gospel? It's the release of the power of God. The gospel is the power and wisdom of God, it says in verses 18 and 24. It is stronger and wiser than the wisdom of men and the power of men. It's the revelation of the power of God. It is the message of the gospel. And the message of the gospel is always what we could not do, God did. And what we refused to do, God did for us. The consequence is that we live a life that is empowered and directed 
by the greatest strength and wisdom that exists. So why doesn't everyone just buy into the gospel? Why doesn't everyone just say, I want to sign on to that kind of a life? That's because everyone has one of two filters. And you saw it in this passage. There are those who are perishing, and there are those who are being saved. Here's the difference between the two. If you are perishing, the Holy Spirit is not yet stirring your heart. If you are being saved, the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart. That means when you hear the gospel, a clear presentation of the gospel, this sounds crazy. When someone who's being saved hears a clear presentation of the gospel, it sounds right. This person rejects And this person moves towards it. What's the difference between the two? It's what the Holy Spirit's doing. Or not doing in them yet. And here's the thing. A lot of churches, a lot of times I am tempted. In fact, I spend a lot of my time very tempted to say, what I want to do is do everything in the church and everything in the service towards that group right there and try to get this group to move towards the gospel. What's the problem with that? It's impossible because this is what's going on in that person's life spiritually. So what we try to do as a church is we try to make the gospel as clear as possible. Not always the same way, not always focusing on the same part of the gospel, but we always try to make clear that we are broken, that God loves us and pursues us even when we are his enemies, and he forgives us and gives us new life through Jesus. Every Sunday, we try to make that clear. Because we as Christians need to hear it. And a non-Christian who the Holy Spirit is working in, when we make that clear, will say, that sounds right. Let me stop. If you are in that category, if you do not yet have a relationship with Jesus, but what I just wrote, you said, that sounds right. That thought didn't occur to you on your own. That is God at work in your life, drawing you to him. There are two approaches to wisdom. There's the wisdom of the world, which is an awe of the power of man. There's the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is an awe of the power of God. What are the implications for FBC? Really two of them. One is we try to join in the power of God. And the second is we try to trust the Holy Spirit. We try to join in the power of God by not trying to to get you to be obedient by just gritting your teeth and working really hard at applying principles and rules. What we try to do every Sunday is say, this is who your God is. That's why we close every sermon with a benediction and a challenge. The benediction is a one-sentence summary of what the sermon has said about this is who God is. The challenge is said because this is who God is. This is how we live differently. The second thing is we trust the Holy Spirit to work. I don't need to sell the gospel. I don't need to entertain you with the gospel. I need to make it clear and trust that the Holy Spirit does his work. There's one other thing. I talked about you can grade my sermons. Here, this is the key. The second one is the key. I trust that when the Holy Spirit inspired scripture, he had a purpose. Our job as preachers when we preach a passage, is to say, what is the purpose of that passage? What was the Holy Spirit doing with that passage and enter in? I will always say at the end of every sermon, the point of the passage and the point of the sermon is. That is because the point of the sermon must be the point of the passage. 
And I can trust that the Holy Spirit inspired this for a reason. Remember, Paul didn't write this to preachers. Paul wrote this to the congregation. What are the implications for you? Well, the question is, what do you anticipate? What do you hunger for? What do you thirst for when you walk into church? Do you want entertainment? Do you want to be educated? Do you want advice for living? Do you want inspiration? There's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not enough. What we are invited to anticipate, to desire, is the power of God through the proclamation of his word and through the gospel. And that's the point. Anticipate the power of God. That is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians when he preaches. That is what they should anticipate. That is what they should understand that they are going to receive. It is the power of God because he is going to declare the gospel again and again and again. And the gospel is fruitful for us even as believers. Sunday mornings, we must be reminded of the truth that we are free from fear free from trying to be in control. We must be reminded that God loves us and pursues us even when we're his enemy, and he certainly is going to do it when we are his children. He has invited us into life with him, and that life is the greatest blessing that we can have. The reasons the road signs were confusing is because they were contradictory. If we fall into saying you can live the Christian life through worldly wisdom, we have become those road signs, and we are contradictory. How do we respond? Suggest four ways. First, encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 and, and identify what does Paul say about his message? What is it that he preaches Share with someone, share the power of God. Invite someone to encounter the power of God at FBC. Pray, continue in the 40 days of prayer. If you've not yet picked up a prayer guide, you can pick one up here at the church, out in the lobby. Continue to pray for FBC. That makes a huge difference when we come together. And a discipline to practice. Every Sunday when you walk into church, anticipate not being entertained, not being inspired, not being lectured to, anticipate the power of God through the gospel. You have connection cards that are here, and on the back of that, there's a place for you to indicate how you want to respond to this sermon. Maybe it's one of these, maybe it's something else. But if you will indicate that and leave that in one of the boxes in the foyer, we as a staff will pray for you. As you seek to apply the power of God, the message of his word in your life. I want to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as they come forward, I want to invite us to stand. We're going to close in prayer. Why do we close in prayer? This is one of the things that we have to do to remind us that we are dependent on God. I'd never want to send us out of here and saying, here are things to do, now go do them. There's nothing wrong with that, but I want to remind us that we go and do them through the power of God and not just gritting our teeth and working hard. So would you join me in praying for that now? Heavenly Father, we are fallen, sinful creatures. And we recognize that that is where the good news of the gospel starts. We can stop playing games with one another. We can stop playing games with ourselves. And we can stop playing games with you. We recognize that you know everything about us. And you love us. You pursue us. You embrace us. And you love us enough not to leave us where we are. But to change us. To become more like your son. Lord, help us every Sunday to walk in here thirsting for those words, the reminder of your love and your grace and your mercy that is at work in our lives, that we can give up trying to be in control. We can give up the fear of what we might lose or what we might not gain 
because we know the one who cares for us. Lord, help us live in light of the gospel today. We want to come before you, Lord, and ask for the strength to do that because on our own, it is not possible. And we thank you that you give us that strength. In Jesus' precious name, amen. These folks are here to pray with you no matter what you need to pray for, but especially if you don't know the Savior. So I told you every Sunday I need to leave you with a thought of who God is and a challenge, a charge for what to do in response. This is what we said about who God is. The same God who loved you and pursued you when you were his enemy trapped in sin is the same God who loves you and pursues you even as you are a child of God. That's what it is to live the Christian life. So you are dismissed to remember the gospel this week and to anticipate it next Sunday and every Sunday that you walk into church. You are dismissed.